and these inconsistencies we have identified how and looking forward how potentially could these issues be addressed. And before we start, I'm going to introduce um, the speakers. So obviously you already know my work to the previous uh, panel, but we also have um, next to me uh, Doug Marshy, who is a professor of law with a focus on European Union law, comparative law and labor law at Queen's University Belfast. She holds a Germany at the Frontier in EU law uh, and policy, and she directs the Center of European and International Legal Studies and also the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence Tensions at the Fringes of European Union, which is an interdisciplinary project. She has extensive experience and written extensively on the topics of employment law discrimination uh, at EU level and comparative level, and lately she has been focusing increasingly on intersectionality and multiple discrimination, and she has published several books on these topics. Um, next to Dagmar, we have Anne Mahalyokani, sorry for my pronunciation, uh, who is a professor at Brown University and at the Faculty of Law. She formerly was also the co vice chancellor at Brown University, and she has also written widely on labor law and especially employment law and non discrimination law. And finally, we also have as a discussant uh, Insignia Caracciolo di Sorbello, who is an associate professor at uh, the University of Leicester Law School. Um, she was also a visiting researcher at the Center of European Law at the University of Oslo. And she has also written extensively, uh, especially on parental rights, pregnancy and maternity discrimination, and work-life balance issues. And um, she uh, is also the Cultural Equal Opportunities Officer at the, at the law school. Thank you all for being here. And we will start with Mark Bell on the future evolution of 2000 directly. Um, so, uh, so thank you very much to Sarah and uh, Anya for organising uh, such a great day and for the invitation to, to take part uh, in that. Um, I had a, a quite a broad title in thinking of the, the future uh, for the Equality Grounds from 2000 and there were, when I began to focus upon it, there were very many things that I could have picked up upon but uh, in the interests of of having a, 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 a focus for a short period of time. I wanted to focus on, on issues around the accommodation of workplace diversity. Uh, and as has been mentioned, uh, Sarah and Anya have both written very uh, interesting articles in the European Labour Law Journal from the, the previous uh, project. And I think this is a theme that kind of uh, picks up from both of those books. Sarah had reflected on uh, coherence and the approach to reasonable accommodation across different grounds, but also um, in relation to the working time directive and the accommodation of flexibility in working time arrangements and, uh, and the, the premise of the working time directive, which is very much focused on, on normal working time, assuming that normal working time is a full time week. So, um, so uh, what I really wanted to sort of look at is in a way, how do organisations, uh, both individual employers and workers, uh, manage and respond to uh, diversity within the workplace and, and adapting to diversity uh, and the contribution that EU law makes at present and then to, to, to put out some suggested possibilities for how we might move forward in this area. Um, so. My starting point was really to, in a sense, set the law to one side and think about these issues from the perspective of uh, organisational practice. And this, in a way, uh, was a stemmed from a project that uh, myself and, and Lucy were both involved with, which is the International Labour Organisation, which was to develop uh, a practical guide for employers on uh, promoting diversity and inclusion through workplace ad adjustments. Uh, and um, 
that uh, guy didn't make any presupposition about what the legal framework was because it was going to all of the member states that are part of the ILO, um, uh, but it was really focusing on, uh, in a sense, business practice, how do organisations deal with requests for adjustments uh, in, that, that may arise from their workforce. Um, and in a sense, it confronted uh, the growing diversity in the labour market and uh, I won't go through all the statistics in detail, but just uh, when I was preparing for this, looking back at you know the labour market statistics from say 1999 or, or 2000, clearly there's a higher participation of women in work. There's a higher participation now of, of older workers at work in some member states and particularly in some cities. We we see uh, more um, uh, higher levels of of, of migrant workers, more ethnic diversity and more religious diversity in the workplace. Um, these and other issues uh, are likely to mean that many organisations will face at some point uh, or another or very frequently requests from employees for some kind of adjustment or adaptation in the way in which work is organised. <coughs> typically it entails a process of dialogue often initiated by the individual worker. Um, it also implies well, flexibility, um, uh, and flexibility is a, is a premise that's been part of uh, EU labour market regulation policy for, for, for some time now. Um, and, and some kind of assessment of, of proportionality or striking a balance, what would be reasonable, um, um, in terms of changes to perhaps uh, working time or the location where work is performed or how work is performed. Um, and of course, within that framework, legal rights can play a part. Obviously, in, in, in the EU, we have a, a very firm underpinning of, of a legal duty for reasonable accommodation in relation to disability. But probably when those conversations begin in the workplace, law isn't necessarily the first place that an individual worker or an employer will turn to in order to try and resolve uh, a request uh, for a change. Uh, and law has an influence to play, it probably sets certain parameters, uh, obviously in relation to disability, it, 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 it partic creates particular duties for the employer, uh, uh, but it, it, it isn't the, the, the only influence on how those issues are handled. So if we turn to think about uh, law, in this area and it strikes me that again if we kind of cast our minds back to when the 2000 directives were adopted the inclusion of a duty of reasonable accommodation within uh, uh, directive 2078 was, was one of the novelties of the directives and in the period since then the idea of reasonable accommodation uh, has become much more firmly embedded in our concept of equality clearly the, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities uh, it, it clarifies that denial of reasonable accommodation uh, is part of the prohibition of discrimination and that has in turn more recently influenced case law at the European Court of Human Rights uh, which has recognised that Article 14 can also extend to the idea of denial of reasonable accommodation uh, and it's interesting that actually we, when you look at the, the Employment Equality Directive it doesn't actually specifically clarify how, what uh, a breach of the reasonable accommodation duty, what that entails in terms of is that a form of discrimination and different national legislation categorises that in a variety of different ways. But I think now it, it, that, that's quite a settled uh, issue. Um, yet, in the same period, there's, there's not much that you could point to to say that there's any trend towards extending accommodation duties to out beyond uh, uh, disability. Uh, some of the research that's been done for the European Commission, uh, uh, for example, in reports by, by Lucy or uh, Emmanuel Barbosi and Rory, have, you know, there are measures that you can find in certain jurisdictions that uh, um, extend uh, obligations of accommodation implicitly or explicitly, but it's quite 
quite fragmented and quite limited. Um, and of course, as has already been a point, pointed to today, we do see some examples in case law where using other concepts uh, lead to uh, implicit obligations of, of accommodation, such as in Awaida, where the court uh, of human rights sort of tentatively steps in the direction of, of, of using its proportionality assessment of art, uh, in relation to Articles 9 and 14 to require an employer to accommodate uh, uh, within, a, the, the com within the, in relation to a workplace dress code. Uh, and in the UK, actually, there's been a lot of uh, religious case law around indirect discrimination, uh, using the concept of indirect discrimination uh, uh, through efforts to, uh, to uh, uh, make religious accommodation. I'm not sure that that case law is so uh, widely reflected in any of the other EU jurisdictions uh, as, as perhaps the UK is probably at the forefront there. Um, when we look more broadly, if we kind of, whilst clearly the, the Employment Equality Directive has this explicit duty of accommodation in relation to disability, but if we think more about the idea of when does an employer have to adapt or change uh, the working environment to reflect the needs of the individual worker or groups of workers? We can point to some developments in that regard. So for example, when the parental leave directive was revised in 2010, it includes this obligation that workers, uh, when returning from parental leave, may request changes to their working hours or the patterns for a set period of time, uh, employers shall consider and respond to such requests. So quite cautious, really just a, a right of request, but again, sort of moving in that, the direction of, of providing a framework within which uh, workers can seek changes to whatever standard working arrangements are. And the part-time work directive also refers to employers should give consideration to requests to change from full time to part time work, um, um, not necessarily an enforceable right. And as has been mentioned earlier in the day, the more, most recent proposals uh, uh, from the, the European Commission include a right to request flexible working for parents of, of children up to the age of 12 and for workers with caring responsibilities. Um, so the, the, there's, there's a, a, a slight um, uh, uh, shift in the direction of that employers should, in certain circumstances, uh, be willing to change normal uh, working arrangements to reflect the needs of workers. Um, the case law of the, of the Court of Justice on, on the duty of reasonable accommodation, I'll, I'll, I'll not look at this in, 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 in depth because of time, uh, but the court's earliest uh, pronouncement on this in the Coleman case was to say very explicitly and unambiguously that the duty of reasonable accommodation is limited to persons with disabilities. It didn't actually necessarily need to say that on, on the facts of the case, but it, 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 it in a sense contrasted that with the prohibition of discrimination, which could be extended to persons who were associated with, with persons with disabilities. But, it could, but in contrast, it said that the duty of reasonable accommodation was only for persons with disabilities. And um, so it places some limits. And we saw that that kind of was uh, Advocate General Cockcock, I think, went, went back to that in, in her opinion in Akita. Um, in the Ring case, the court, in a sense, is, is, the, is the only sort of very substantive examination of how far reasonable accommodation should go. It recognizes that it, it, it covers flexibility in working time. But I think what was interesting also in that judgment was that um, the, in the court's application of the principle of indirect discrimination, the court held that, that a legal provision that provided for the possibility to dismiss someone flexibly after 180 days of, of paid sick leave, that that, <coughs> that general norm might need to be changed or adapted in relation to a person with a disability who had disability related uh, sickness absence. And so that indicates that actually the obligation to adapt, whether it's legal practices or organisational practices, don't necessarily only flow <coughs> from the duty of reasonable accommodation, but can also come out of the, the, the principle of, of indirect discrimination uh, as well, even in relation to, to disability. Um, 
and the sad to fears to see uh, uh, that one of the Auditor General uh, uh, Val um, explored reasonable accommodation uh, in relation to surrogacy. Uh, the court didn't uh, explore that further, but he indicated that in his view, uh, reasonable accommodation could only be uh, unpaid leave and could, couldn't extend as far as a paid leave of absence. Um, and of course, this has been touched upon at several points in today's proceedings. Uh, we have uh, the, the recent uh, decisions in, in, in the Head Start cases, and where in Afita there is, uh, without going into the full uh, dimensions of, 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 of the case, there is this rather uh, strained and complex uh, uh, sentence from the court where it, it hints at the possibility that the organisation should have considered redeployment of the individual, but it does so in a, in a very um, sort of convoluted way, um, and, and, and particularly this expression that without G4S being required to take on an, an additional burden, so in a sense it seems that as, as long as it would create no uh, difficulty whatsoever for G4S, then uh, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't have been an obligation to do this. So a very low threshold, it seems, insofar as this is, could, could be approximated to an accommodation <coughs> measure at all. Um, uh, and, and we might even debate the, the, the appropriateness of seeing, putting, putting somebody effectively in the back room as to whether that's the kind of accommodation uh, that, that, w that uh, com uh, is compatible with more general notions of of, of equal treatment. Um, I think it was also interesting in uh, Advocate General Sharpston's opinion uh, where she was more explicit about uh, using the principle of reasonable accommodation as part of the proportionality analysis. However, she, I, I think, almost anticipating all of the, the, the sensitivities that that would raise up, she kind of goes out of her way to say but that wouldn't mean that it would extend to proselytism in the workplace and it wouldn't mean that you would have to per permit full face um, veils or, or wearing of the niqab or the, the burqa. Uh, things that of course weren't actually on the facts of the case at issue, but it also perhaps indicates to us that reasonable accommodation in relation to religious practice can raise issues uh, that don't necessarily ar arise in relation to disability uh, and, and uh, an, an awareness that accommodation, uh, extending the notion of reasonable accommodation to other uh, 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 characteristics may open up different uh, uh, questions in terms of when is it justified to deny an accommodation uh, that, don't, that aren't necessarily the kinds of issues that are, are typically arise in relation to an assessment of of disproportionate burden in terms of reasonable accommodation for disabled persons, where it's it's more often a question of of economic cost or or or, or organisational disruption, let's say. So just to sort of, uh, in a way, go back to in a way where I started of you know the organisation that faces the, the the variety of requests that may come up from from different workers for for uh, accommodations or adjustments. Well, we can see that different legal instruments uh, in a variety of ways uh, do create obligations uh, to adapt the working environment uh, to the worker, whether it's indirect discrimination, reasonable accommodation uh, in relation to disability, uh, or certain legislation relating to issues like pregnancy and maternity, to, parental leave and also in a way this echoes uh, a duty, a more general duty that we find in health and safety law about where one of the general principles is the idea of adapting work to the individual. But I think from the perspective probably of an employer, um, if you're having to advise them, these are quite fragmented and frequently quite implicit obligations that it would be hard to kind of uh, distill into a, any simple uh, uh, um, or, or coherent form. Coherence has been obviously one of the themes of the events today. So I was 
tried to turn my mind to, well, what would be the options for, for, for possible reform in the future here? And I, I want to just preface what I'm suggesting to say. I'm not necessarily recommending any of these particular options, but for, for the purpose of the exercise of thinking about how could we uh, develop the law, um, three possibilities, and I'm sure there are more, uh, occurred to me. Um, one is uh, that we could try to move forward through, let's say, soft law instruments uh, to, to try to promote good practice for organisations on how do they handle requests that they receive from workers for adjustments. Because it's very likely that most, if not all, organisations, even small organisations, at some point in time will receive a request from a worker for a temporary or permanent adjustment of fund description uh, and how, how are they handled? So could we, for example, through uh, the social dialogue process or, or uh, uh, think about uh, you know, instruments that might set, identify norms in that area or uh, to, to, in a sense, borrow uh, the, the, the techniques that we see emerging, in, uh, particularly around work-family reconciliation, uh, as, as Nicole uh, told us about earlier. Uh, the, the, this, the direction of, of kind of right to request, perhaps as a precursor to an actual right to have something, could there be more uh, a right to request uh, a workplace adjustment? Could we set certain norms in terms of the procedures that would be applied in terms of how such requests would be handled, even if the substantive decision uh, would remain within the, within the, the, the discretion of, of, of the uh, uh, employer. Um, and, and that's a, a model that's been used in some other areas of, of labour law. And then obviously, I suppose, the, the, you know, the, the, the more ambitious uh, idea that, has, that sometimes comes up in some literature is the idea of extending the duty of reasonable accommodation to other or all characteristics. Um, I think, you know, the political realities are that we know that that's not uh, likely to happen. Uh, but I think we would also have to reflect upon: can we just lift the duty that's been developed in the area of disability law and easily transplant that to quite sometimes quite different contexts? and different considerations, particularly in the area of, of justifications for, for rejecting a, 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 a request for accommodation. But it did, I think, prompt uh, a reflection that one of the, uh, one thing is that, that perhaps warrants further reflection and consideration is, is also how do organisations uh, address competing accommodation requests or where the needs of different groups may, may not be easily reconciled um, themselves. And just a very sort of simple illustration, I suppose, of, of how that sometimes those things may come to the fore. Um, a case that went to the Supreme Court in the UK, I'm sure many will be familiar with uh, Pauli and the first group. That was a case about the access of a wheelchair user to uh, 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 a public bus where the space for the wheelchair user was already occupied uh, by um, uh, a, a woman with a, with a child in a pram, and in a sense, the, 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 which of those should be prioritised where there was com com competition for the access to that space. So, um, uh, extending uh, obligation perhaps would also require us to sort of uh, think about the, the balancing of competing requests.
gender equality for uh, the future. Uh, and uh, as we've already heard today, uh, gender uh, equality is sure dealt with in the uh, background treaties and so on uh, in a more elaborated way than uh, many of the other non-discrimination grounds. And it, it's also uh, related to not in only in terms of to combat discrimination, but also to uh, promote equality. Equality, we heard, is reserved for uh, gender equality. There's a special Article 23 in addition to Article 21 in the Charter and so on, uh, all suggesting a higher level of constitutional constitutionalization uh, to, to speak with Colm, and also suggesting a substantive and more proactive approach than regarding other grounds. Yes, we have heard about the hierarchy of grounds, and I will not go into that discussion no, no, now, but maybe say that ethnicity, if we look at equality instruments proper, seem to be at the top, and then maybe sex equality, and uh, I will leave uh, the other grounds. Uh, so <coughs> the question is, would a coherent equality regulation do the trick, so to say. Sarah, in her background article, argues uh, that uh, uh, dignity is a common ground for all non-discrimination grounds, uh, but she also adds that uh, uh, we would have to recognize specific needs, which may be, uh, have to, have to be, have to be uh, heard to uh, in different uh, ways. I very much agree with the latter. Uh, dignity may be the common ground, I will not argue with that, but that is surely not enough uh, from my point of view, and especially not talking about gender uh, discrimination. Sonnet in engineering equality has argued that there is no real redistributive element to non-discrimination law. Uh, the reference norms, so to say, they are external to non-discrimination law itself. But the areas that we have chosen to cover with bans on discrimination, their dis distributive concerns uh, matter. We have uh, covered, for instance, working life with bans on discrimination, and that is precisely because there are very important distributive concerns in society with regard to working lives. Uh, so that is an important part of uh, equality regulation. Uh, we all know also that uh, <coughs> uh, Article 119 is time and the prohibition of pay discrimination and so on uh, was at the very beginning of uh, the union. And uh, so, the, uh, and later on broadened to cover equal treatment of men and women in a more uh, generalized way. And <coughs> one would think after so many years that uh, we should have uh, solve this problem, and though I will not deny that we have made progress, there is still a lot to be done. And if we look, look at uh, still considerable shortcomings with regard to equality, we have the employment gap, uh, uh, picturing that women do not partake in labor market to the same extent as men, and are also marginalized, uh, that is, in flexible work, part-time, and so on. Uh, this being, of course, related to the persisting gender pay gap, uh, which in turn is perpetuated in the pension, gender pension gap. Uh, and we have the work-life balance challenges where men share of unpaid work lags behind. Lags behind. Uh, in this uh, uh, slide, uh, the new policies uh, in the form of the proposal for a European pillar of social rights that we have already heard of, and I will not go into any details here, but uh, the, uh, the pillar of proposal is complemented with the proposed directive on work-life balance for parents and carers, which we have also heard uh, about to some extent, and an interpretative communication on the working time directive, recognizing or revealing the insight, finally, that work-life balance is at 
income inequalities at home are, of course, uh, related to the existing gender pay gap. So are some expenses, can be consensus and tax laws, for instance, and economics in general, and not least the economic crisis of later years. Uh, very important are, however, also inherent limitations in equality law itself, as reflected in this case in the Lawrence and Allenby uh, cases. Uh, despite the fact that there is no need for intention for discrimination to be at hand, there is the requirement of responsibility for the differential treatment. Uh, here reflected in the quest for a common source. And <coughs> this reflects, of course, market hegemony uh, in general. I'm not only talking about the internal market here, but uh, market hegemony in, in general, <coughs> and also respect for individual ownership of fundamental rights uh, for that matter. Uh, so, despite some openings, for instance, in the, some, in the fixed term work directive, like the part time directive and fixed term contract directive, there is an opening for comparisons outside the workplace. Uh, we have not really seen any practical uh, results uh, from this. Uh, so, I still see no real way around this. And this is extremely important because one of the very big problems the labor market is the segregated uh, labor markets. That is that women are working <coughs> in special branches, in other professions than men are, and so uh, there are not the same source for the rules to be applied or how to apply them. And then equality law uh, does not get there. It doesn't solve uh, the problem. So that is really important. Sweden, and then there is the role of the social partners more uh, generally, because they are, of course, agents or actors on this market. And <coughs> only recently in Sweden we had a doctoral thesis presented by Lena Steneos. Maybe some of you recall her. She was a former Swedish Equal Opportunity Ombudsman, a representative in the Commission's Network for Equality Between Men and Women. Uh, in Sweden, trade unions are still quite important and collective agreements cover 90% of labor market and wage is an issue for the social partners. Still, after so many years, there is uh, a gender pay gap uh, quite equal to the average in the European Union. Lena studied this, uh, <coughs> uh, this in her uh, thesis and the, the conclusion is quite depressing in the sense that uh, uh, what happened was, was that social partners who have been critical, not only in creating, but also in recreating the gender pay gap on the Swedish labor market. So, to work-life balance then. Uh, we have the proposed directive and I will not, on, on work-life balance, and I will not go into detail to some extent, Nicole already uh, told us about the strength of paternity parental leave rights. There is also very important uh, re uh, uh, relation to flexible work working arrangements. And <coughs> I will not go into the details how they uh, define flexible working arrangements here, but uh, what is notable is that it's said to be not only to the, uh, to the positive for work-life balance, but also for communist companies as such and uh, society at large. And there is where we get a bit worried about these mixed motives, so to say. Uh, so the question is, what are the prospects for these very welcome uh, per se uh, initiatives. Now we have the employment gap and inequalities at home, and of course this initiative uh, is welcome in the sense that it will, if it should, should be accepted in the future, which of course is a big if, uh, 
it will certainly be uh, steps in the right direction. Uh, however, the question is if it will re uh, lead to any real changes. Uh, Anja, in her article, has argued that such changes must come with an adapted work norm all uh, together. Uh, that is, that work-life strategies must ultimately incorporate standard working hour con configurations that really support uh, sustainable work patterns, including all elder workers, women workers, parents, parents, and so on. Uh, <coughs> and this, in its turn, may be very difficult uh, to attain, of course. And one of the reasons is that also here the social partners are quite important. Uh, maybe I should come in so fast here. Uh, quite important in uh, recreating the conditions of the labor market. Another Swedish uh, thesis revealed how trade unions working exactly as trade unions should do, uh, reinforcing the rights of their members. Due to the very segregated Swedish labor market, uh, women work in certain sectors and so on, uh, they negotiated really good conditions for women workers in those sectors. And of course, this did not at all bring about equality, rather on the contrary, because it made it very important and natural that women were the ones who did family work, uh, caring for the children and so on, because they were the ones who had uh, no uh, cuts in remuneration and so on. So in that sense, the social partners are not that reliable. Uh, so the question is, Despite these very welcome <laughs> proposals, we are forced to an insecure future. Uh, the question is how, uh, how uh, positive uh, can we be? Uh, though I do welcome, as I said, this differentiated and comprehensive, more comprehensive regulatory approach, adding to equality regulation of staff by several other means, and uh, the insight that this might require an adapted uh, work norm. Uh, the question is, will it be able to do the trick? And I'm sorry to say that in that sense, I'm not that uh, positive, because uh, I think that uh, uh, economic hegemony is still uh, around and <coughs> the social act and flexible work, for instance, changes of the work in time directive, if, if that would ever come about, also introducing more flexible work hours and so on, invite also economically needed uh, flexible work arrangements, like very intense flexible work, which does not do the trick for equality. Uh, or a more human working, general working norm. And then there is the scope for the social partners that have, has been uh, referred to uh, on various occasions uh, today, uh, which uh, does not, from an historic point of view, seem to be such a reliable partnership for the future uh, when gender equality uh, about. So I'm sorry to end on <laughs> quite uh, pessimistic note here. I'm not really sure that the efforts for the new initiatives welcome enough uh, will really change anything uh, or much, I should say. It will change something. And uh, life will maybe be easier for women combining child work and so on, but uh, I think they will not change the general problem with women being 
did it for 40 minutes, and now I'm putting it much slower down. So I also talk about intersectionality and European Union equality law. And I decided to take a bottom-up approach. I think my time management will be helped by the, by the fact that um, two of the cases I'm discussing have been discussed already. So I will start with the uses and non uses of intersectionality before the European Court of Justice, because we have a very interesting um, dilemma. I will then discuss why should we have used intersectionality, and I have a position there. I think intersectionality is still a good concept. It shouldn't be subsumed into the individual grounds by the Bundles down to point Hilda. Um, do we need more legislation? And luckily, that's an optimistic start. I don't think we do. We can just convince the Court of Justice to do it better and also convince the National Courts to do it better. So my very, very good at trying that intersectionality that got lost somewhere in the European Court of Justice can be summarized in these three um, cases, and I have the case numbers for once on the slide. Paris is a Dublin case, a uh, white homosexual man who wanted his partner included in his um, age, uh, in his pension rights, should he survive it. So it's a survivor's pension case. Um, the Akita and Bobinawi case, which I can't pronounce the last one, if somebody can help me, that would be welcome. Uh, these are the two health health cases from Belgium and France, respectively, which have been decided in March. Now, how did European Union law get to a stage that a white, relatively privileged um, lecturer, I need to call it over here, there are other colleges which have better work, <laughs> <laughs> working relationships, working conditions in Dublin, um, gets referred to the Court of Justice as the first national court asking an explicit question on intersectionality. Our Africa General Cocot making a few attempts to recognize intersectionality, and the court just telling the world, well, he wasn't discriminated on grounds of age, he wasn't discriminated on grounds of homosexuality, so there is no discrimination in the combination either. Also. And then, on the other hand, we get two um, Muslim women who we had staff just being dismissed, and their intersectional discrimination mainly be recognized. They are discussed as a cases on the link between religious freedom and religious discrimination. And the intersection between racist and sexist discrimination is ignored by both those very capable Africa generals. So that's my bottom up perspective. Now, the Paris case is a key Bracken Rate moment for the European Union. The Bracken Rate was one of the cases Kimberly Crenshaw cited when she introduced intersectionality. So that's a case where we have a, 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 a car producer who has to downsize. And in that downsizing, a group which is dismissed consists mainly of black women. However, if you look at how blacks fared, black, uh, black employees fared overall in that downsizing exercise, they weren't affected more negatively than white employees. And if you look at the question, how women overall fared in this downsizing exercise, they weren't protected, they weren't affected more negatively. So it's just the black women, because they were the cohort that had been coming into the employment relations. Now, Paris is very similar. Um, the um, occupational health scheme of Trinity College um, provided for survivor benefits if a partner managed to claim a civil partner before their 60th birthday. And because Ireland introduced um, homosexual civil partnership in 2011, there's a few, uh, there are a few people who can never fulfill this criteria. Now, Africa General Cocot said, well, this is indirect discrimination on grounds of homosexuality. I'm really not convinced by this, because she argues and says that um, because more homosexual men and women will be affected by this criterion than heterosexuals. And that um, presupposes that there are more elderly homosexual persons who decided not to marry traditionally, not to go into hiding, but um, to go be open and to be a partner and to become a civil partner later on and to demand a survivor's pension than younger homosexuals. I don't think that's correct. Um, Ireland has a very young population and plus also the changes in normative approaches to homosexuality means that this assumption is probably wrong. So I'm not convinced that there is an indirect discrimination on grounds of homosexuality. Now age discrimination, surely this is age discrimination. It's a condition 
that you cannot take your partner into your pension, uh, pension um, insurance if you are above a certain age. That's unequal treatment around that age. I should stop short with discrimination because, as we all know, Directive 2078 has a lot of exceptions for age discrimination, and access to a pension scheme at a later age is one of the exceptions. So pension schemes can protect themselves against late intake and that seems to be a um, abstraction. Avocatella Agat, Gokot still comes to the conclusion that it isn't justified that she brings indirectly the intersectionality two into that argument and says of course there is several factor of discrimination in evidence here. The justification for age discrimination must be handled more strictly and that's how she comes to the result that the person is discriminated against. The court is, makes short shrift of this. There is no discrimination around the homosexuality, I agree with that. From the age discrimination is justified under Article 6.2 that the justification you can, uh, the conclusion can come to. And the combination of those grounds then cannot constitute discrimination because those individual discrimination grounds are not satisfied. The Grafen right moment, that's the same um, argument which was given before the US courts, that there is no, we don't have combined <coughs> discrimination grounds and we don't accept intersectionality. I think the court should have done it differently because if it is actually because I think there is no discrimination around um, homosexuality then you can very well say that age discrimination is justified. You have then to look into the combined characteristics. And how can you do that? You can interpret European Union law purposefully and come to that. Now there are other two cases. We have got Ms. Akita, I'm pronouncing her correctly, I hope, um, who started wearing a hat scarf sometime in her um, employment. The facts in the court decision say that the time there was an unwritten rule of political ideological neutrality at work related to clothing. And that rule was then formalized in collaboration with the Works Council when Ms. Akita started wearing a hat scarf and later on she was dismissed soon. Um, Advocate Dana Kokot, um, just as throughout, we can say that it's nothing given all the time. Really, the, I, I counted it somewhere in the first court. However, the ban on religious, political, and philosophical signifies not direct discrimination around the religion and belief. Indirect discrimination justified intersectionality is not discussed at all. Um, she says that it's a business issue to include clothing, and so that's why this case is also discussed as in one of the newer cases where Article 16 of the Charter is overemphasized. The court says, indeed, this is at best indirect discrimination. Actually, the court is a little bit more um, uh, favorable for the employee in, in the end, saying that this is a religious freedom case. Um, we need to consider religious freedom as justification for this and give some homework to the National Court where they could have considered this. But it's not each case, the um, French case, and I have to take one something out of my slide here because I couldn't find that slide back. This individual demands not to wear a headscarf in contact with certain clients. Could wear a hat scarf as long as you wanted, but certain clients wouldn't like somebody with a hat scarf. The principle of this will be justified by reference to genuine business requirement. In this specific case, I mean, customers don't need to wear hats for common sake. And similarly, the court ruled in parallel to as Akita, leave the, the decision to the National Court and says, well, in principle, the refusal you Client of a client of the headscarf might still be an objective business justification, though that needs to be read narrowly. Now, these cases, I think, should all have used intersectionality. Because those Muslim women, although I understand that the claimants want this to be religious cases, I've spoken to counsel, and the counsel said, well, they don't want to be discriminated on grounds of gender and ethnicity, they want to be discriminated on grounds of religion. <laughs> all right. So, but the uh, racialization of Muslims in Europe, I think, is a fact. It's, it's, this is a certain religion which is 
perceive as security risk, as dangerous, as strange, as um, overarching. So that is a case where you can consider, can classify religious discrimination also as ethnic discrimination. I think the gender dimension of the issue falls straight in the face because most monotheistic religions, which are also the patriarchal religions, have closing rules for women. And so that is a clear intersectional case. So what, why should we use intersectionality in those cases? First of all, the justification of gender and ethnic discrimination is much more demanding than justification of religious discrimination. There would be no um, reason to go into the use of religious freedom and the justification of an invariant discrimination if you would classify those as ethnic and sex discrimination. It would be much stricter. And also, if I'm a sub of the uh, national legal order, which have stated, I think the Austrian legislation is explicitly most explicit there, that the intersectional or multiple discrimination cases should be mirrored in the amount of damages to be awarded. So those clients that really have been, have profited. On a more principled level, I think we should recognize all dimensions of discrimination. I'm still sticking with the discrimination and the intersectionality ground, because I think, first of all, the, uh, for the Paris case, demonstrate that we have cases where we can only accept discrimination if we accept intersectionality. And um, the two PESCAP cases allow us to show that, uh, that we can avoid wider exceptions by cumulating claims and by accepting that dimension. And um, the positive EU law does support intersectionality, although not in the article. We do not have a provision telling us intersectional discrimination is prohibited. But the directives, the, uh, the 2000 directives, recognize multiple discrimination, even require a recall for multiple discrimination. I think that uh, obligation was discontinued at some time. And um, while there is no positive definition of intersectional or multiple discrimination, EU law has always been interpreted in a percursive way. You could interpret those directives collectively, prohibiting discrimination on a multiplicity of grounds, as also happening overlap of the grounds. Um, a precondition for this to work properly is, of course, that we remain aware of power imbalances. Often intersectionality theory um, it's, uh, recently does not comply with this demand. But I think there's advantage in many and why majority religion is that you know, as spheres of life, which are fast and some others as well, um, being heterosexual or being perceived as able-bodied or as able and disadvantaged is cumulated in this other part, part. So I would say intersectionality should be applied on the cumulative accumulation of disadvantages because that would be more in line with the purpose of European Union equality law. And I would also say that intersectionality needs to be, how many minutes do I have? Minus five, yeah? <laughs> Minus two, all right. Um, should also be related to the purpose of discrimination. I think this slide has to be shown, but I don't talk much about it because I think most people uh, know it. So I, I think the whole background to capture intersectionality is to redefine our grounds, to reinvent our discrimination grounds, and at the same time allow us to, to interpret the grounds in a wider way, to interpret the grounds in such a way that intersectional discrimination is captured and also in such a way that we don't um, case out intersectional discrimination. So gender identity was part of the legislative um, program earlier. In my slide, you don't need gender identity as a legislative program because somebody who has a non-conformative gender identity will suffer gender discrimination and religious discrimination in the combination. So what was the reason? Do we need new legislation? Not necessarily. We need much more awareness, much more um, perhaps also targeted litigation. And for that, more coherence and fewer hierarchies in European Union anti-discrimination law might help. Because presently, Council will be best advised to treat all cases for race discrimination because that has a wider scope of application. And then next would be gender. And they would not be well advised to focus on religious discrimination as we've seen in Africa. Yeah? If the slide is this way, of course you have to do it. 
but it's not the best mitigation strategy, and that's related to our um, hierarchies and our incoherent um, layout of the EU anti-discrimination laws. The coherence of protection for all grounds would be a precondition for intersectionality to be practically available. But else, I don't think we need having any uh, definition. I feel that there's um, scope for development here, which will also bring the European Union anti-discrimination laws in the dimension. So I hope I've complied with the optimism requirement. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Just, it's, just a, it's the difference between discrimination and equality, what we said before. 
you know, discrimination, non-discrimination is the tool we use. But it's more specific. But what we should aim to achieve is equality, to promote equality. And uh, in doing that, and going back to the, uh, the, the, to the reasonable accommodation, I was thinking, for example, about what I said before, discrimination on grounds of care. Now, in the UK of 2017, in the vast majority, I'm not saying, we have, we have uh, um, uh, cases in which this, this doesn't happen, but I would say that to discriminate on grounds of sexual orientation, on grounds of disability, I'm not saying that this doesn't happen anymore, I'm far from saying that, but I am saying that the vast majority, the message for the vast majority of people has come through, and rightly so. You know, that it is not the thing to do, to discriminate because of those reasons. But there are, in, in the UK of 2017, in many workplaces, it's still the case is that lots of people, women in particular, but also men, they're not discriminated because of gender, but they're discriminated because of caring respons responsibility. Care and responsibility, I'm not talking about childcare, I'm not talking just about childcare, but I'm talking about all the long-term care that people, needs that people may experience. So I'm talking about um, uh, spouses or partners uh, who are ill, or ch disabled children, or um, elderly parents. We will all have an elderly parent in our life. So it's not, you know, we may not all have children, but we all, we, we all have an elderly parent. And in many, many cases, we will have a, a partner who will uh, need, or we will be that person, and our partner will need to care for us. So it's something that is for everybody, but people are still discriminated. And uh, I heard recently uh, by a person who had a certain responsibility saying, talking about Determinant issues say, well, you know, Jenny, one of the things is that people are really getting tired about having to fix around people with children and having to fix their you know, requirements around other people who have children. And I thought, you can't say that. And uh, not only you cannot say that because this is, is discriminatory, but it's also because you're, you're, you are undermining the caring responsibility the whole concept of caring responsibility by saying those with children, those are the bad ones, those are the ones who create the problem. You know, caring responsibility is a much, much broader concept. And uh, so I, I do, I couldn't agree more with what you said about reasonable accommodation and just say that your last, or what is it, the a piece of paper with, your, with, with what you, your last um, uh, suggestion was to extend that not expressly only to disability, but all to the to, to, to all the protected characteristics is right. But we need to make to make allowance for the fact a that that article is not frozen in time, and b to the fact that people are getting discriminated for more than one reason. So the approach needs to be a little bit more complex. Now, uh, I am afraid that I do agree very much with you as well. <laughs> I, you know, it's um, in, in a couple of months ago, um, I, I was asked to go at the very last minute to, to FAIR, uh, to the Academy of European, uh, and to talk about the work-life balance. That, of course, was just the 20 days before the, the, the social pillars was published. So I really I couldn't do much. But on that occasion, I said I wasn't really expecting too much. And if you remember, I also said another thing, which people look at me and shake their, their head and say, remember that when we talk about work-life balance in 2008, the reason why it didn't work in 2015 then was because there was the economic, what, what happened was the economic situation. Now, in 2017, maybe we do not have the same economic issue, but we have best. And uh, I hope that it's not going to be a case, and in that room, everybody look at me and say, oh, <laughs> <laughs> but I hope that it's not going to be the case, that that is going to be another excuse 
to say, well, there are other things to worry about. But when I say I couldn't agree more with what you said, right, that start, new start pro pro uh, project has two, uh, has two elements, as the legislative elements and the non-legislative elements. If we look at the legislative elements, what are we talking about? We're talking about paid parental leave, which is great, but is at sickness level. So at sickness level, it will reiterate the problems we have at the moment because chances are that women more than uh, men will be able to take it, making a balance between, I hope you buy it. <laughs> the 10 days for paternity leave, within Europe, almost all the member states have some sort of paternity leave now. It's not that, that huge things that will change, isn't it? Not for the least. Mm. And, uh, as I say, 10 days, can they really change the gender balance? Five days for care leave, this is great, but five days, will it really address the issue? Flexible working arrangement, I'm happy here because the, the only reason why I'm happy here, they are in the work-life balance directive. And that the simple fact that they're there is such a very important thing <coughs> because all the measures we had before, they were kind of detached from, uh, kind of <coughs> detached from the, 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 the work-life uh, balance issue. Parents were using it, but they were using it irrespective of what the, the instrument was. So that, I think, is very important. What I'm more happy about is the non-legislative measure. Because the non-legislative measure, if you look there, we talk a lot about um, uh, spreading good practices. And we talk, and there is talk about funding, using funding to help member states with their care provision, long-term care provision for children and for the elderly in particular, you know, and this is, I think, where something could really, really change. So I agree with you, it's in theory, it's a fantastic idea, but it doesn't really tell us very much which is new, and I don't really think that what is happening is really goes far enough. But it's a, it's a starting point. But we are in 2017, we st uh, we're still here talking about, you know, a good starting, you know, a, a, a good first step. We shouldn't talk about the first step at this stage. Thank you very much for this additional insight on the, particularly on the new proposal from the Commission. And now we have a little bit of time left if there are any questions or comments.
presentation of the 2000 directive and there I just out I said well th this is a danger to create reasonable re accommodation as in a uh, right which is focused on individual accommodation mm -hmm. where we can have a structural right derived from indirect discrimination which is different and this there was quite some was some case in the United States on gender discrimination on indirect discrimination which resulted in reasonable accommodation but in a much less individual way and that goes under the uh, heading is a less intrusive measure which you can take. Do you really have to take the women off the shops or can you perhaps have modern factories for people? Yeah? And that's a structural change which is good for everybody, whereas reasonable accommodation as it's some as it is sometimes con considered, not in, in the UK law as I found, is very much about the individual um, remedy and not talking about structure. And so that's why that's why I read the Akita case in a more positive way as well, looking in the in the in the justification and checking whether employees can structurally behave differently. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I'll, I'll defer. I mean, I, I think um, I think in the in the court's application uh, of the concept of indirect discrimination 
I mean, there's the first step is finding that there is particular disadvantage, um, and the court moves through that very quickly. Um, and I think it's quite, I think perhaps because of the factual scenario, uh, um, the impact of, of such practices on, in particular, Muslim women, the court it doesn't hesitate to see that there is a great disadvantage here that makes it an indirect discrimination. And I, and I suppose we have to wait and see whether that would necessarily be the same in a case where someone was raising the same issues around a religious practice which is less common or where their particular practice was more uh, different from that of the, the wider religious community. And I mean, that was the stumbling block that Awaida had in the English courts, but not at Strasbourg. So, um, however, I do think that once you've set across that first step and said, well, there is particular disadvantage, so then the focus is on, can it be justified? Uh, and so, you know, is there a legitimate aim and is it an appropriate and necessary way to meet that aim? So that then takes you through into the proportionality assessment. I think that's where the, the court, in a sense, is saying, well, I, 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 um, a, a, you know, a proportionality might mean making an adjustment even for an individual because that could be a way that you can secure the company policy but with less harsh impact on this particular individual uh, which is not dissimilar to, to an idea of accommodation. I mean it's difficult because I think the, the way in which that particular sentence is written is really quite opaque. Uh, I mean and it, you could read that in so many different ways. And, I mean, like, I, 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 I have no no insight into the reasoning of the court, but obviously it's a, it, it's, a, it's, it's a very, where the court has to come to a single judgment, and probably inevitably there was a multiplicity of perspectives amongst the judges. You have to wonder, is this an attempt to try to sort of compromise between the, the varying opinions that were no doubt there within the court and, it, and it's rather cumbersome language that leaves quite a wide discretion for the national court as to whether they want to dwell on this extensively or whether they very simply say oh well it would have been too onerous for them to have to to do this um but i think going back to something somebody else said earlier it certainly would be very interesting to consider whether if, if that same issue was played out eventually before strasbourg um, like their approach to analysing the situation in a way that did seem to require the employer to 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 assume some burden, or, you know, in that they would have to allow a change to the universal the uniform code. It's not a costly burden to the employer, but it w was was something. Yeah. Would any company like to react to the